Greetings and welcome to Gomantak TV. Friends, we have an interesting guest with us today, Kobad Gandhi, who has been in jail for almost 10 years, accused as one of the top ideologues of Naxalite movement in the country. He's recently come out with his book, The Fractured Freedom, and we'll be talking to him about this book and about his journey and about his days in the prison. Welcome, Kobad. Welcome to Gomantak TV. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here in Goa. What brought you to Goa first and foremost? Actually, uh, after nearly a long period of 40 years, I came here at the invitation of the Liberty and Light Festival. The Liberty and Light Festival contacted uh, our publishers and publishers suggested I come here and present the book and present a talk on the book. And uh, so I came here with the book, both in English and Marathi, because there's both audience. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought me here. The festival got over the day before yesterday. I'm leaving today, back for Bombay. Mm -hmm. your, the title of your book is Fractured Freedom. Tell us a little bit about this fractured freedom that you want to present to the people of India. Yeah, actually, this uh, after my jail journey, full over 10 years in jail, uh, all as an under trial, with no conviction. I uh, came out in uh, October 2019. And uh, after that, uh, there was talk about writing a jail diary and things like that, all that stuff. But uh, I had the concept in jail in 2012, I had written a, a, a s series of six articles entitled Freedom and People's Emancipation which I try to give a perspective of what went wrong and how one can still act in the future. And I wanted to develop that concept. So this book is basically the first section, first chapter, the first section is basically on our past life. That's my late wife, Anuradha, and mine. Book is dedicated to her as I treat her as a model uh, human being and model communist also. Uh, the second chapter is the jail experience and the last is uh, really the continuation of what I wrote in 2012 on the philosophical aspects of the movement and how we can do a little bit better maybe in the future. It ends with a hope. So, because it's uh, hopeful in this very dull atmosphere in the country and the world, pandemic and all that, I was surprised at the response it got. It was on the Amazon best English was on the Amazon bestseller list for over a year. And it sold really well. And now it's coming, it's already come out in three Indian languages. That's Marathi, Punjabi and Bengali. It's coming out in another four or five uh, Indian languages in very soon. Mm -hmm. So you are a product of Doon School. Then you went to London yeah. and you pursued degree in accounts. You are a very CA. established and very successful CA. Yeah. From that career to the life with downtrodden in the country, and then you worked among the people, you worked among Dalits, you worked among Adivasis, you worked among various downtrodden sections of Indian society. In 2009, you were arrested and you were released in 2019. Yeah. How do you look at this entire journey, right from your work among the people to your journey to the jail? Actually, it's uh, no doubt Doon School was there and then I went to do my CA in London, but there we are being Parsis, we are in a very claustrophobic atmosphere. We know nothing really about society. And uh, they like witness racism, people being treated and humiliated. My study into the causes of racism, from racism, colonialism, from colonialism, Marxism, uh, then the freedom struggle, how it went and how it was betrayed afterwards. All that stuff, uh, particularly a book by Rajni Pam that uh, uh, India today really changed my perspective and brought me towards Marxism. And uh, then I felt, though I was good at my CA, I passed my first examination. I was the article, uh, firm that I was article to were uh, very happy with my auditing. I felt that that's not my line. And uh, by coincidence or by accident, rather, the, uh, I, while having a street corner meeting, I was speaking on racism, we were attacked by skinheads and then arrested by the uh, cops and they were even more racist than the skinheads, they took me aside. Other two who were arrested were whites, and but I was taken away separately, beaten up, filthy abuse against Indians. So all so this that... Was, this was in London? In London, yeah. Yes. 
Mm. And then finally, after, then I gave up the CA. I continued staying there for the case. But then uh, even the judge was very racist finally. And uh, I said that, see, uh, you have looted our country and destroyed our country over two, three centuries. And uh, this racism is part of that colonial mentality and we are not going to accept it. And, you know, he was livid. He sent me straight to jail, once with jail. Mm. And uh, then he sentenced us to three months imprisonment. Yeah. And then you came to India and uh, you've written a lot about Anuradha Gandhi, your yeah. wife. Yeah. How did you come in touch with Anuradha Gandhi and how were you kind of drawn towards the movement, the leftist movement in the country? Actually, when I came back to Bombay in 1972, I had no contact with any social organization, let alone left organization or Naxalite or anything. And I was staying at Worley at my father's place. He was very sympathetic to everything that I did. And uh, I was started working in a slum nearby called Mayanagar. And uh, then I saw some posters of an altered alternative university. And I attended it. It was the, uh, being run actually organized by what was I came to know later was the Janshakti, organize, Janshakti party, the, one of the Naxalite factions. And then I joined with them and there only I met Anuradha. She was a student leader then at Elphinstone. Mm -hmm. So then one thing uh, led to another. We continued in Mayanagar, the Dalit Panther movement. Within a year of working there, the Dalit Panther movement worked out, bu burst out. Again, I didn't know, like I didn't know anything about racism. I didn't know anything on caste. I looked it up and I saw it was a horrendous form of oppression in India. And since then, there's no looking back. Practically, uh, the entire life we worked on the caste issue and amongst Mahars in uh, Maharashtra. After shift, we married in 77. Then in 82, we shifted to Nagpur. And after one or two years of looking around, we stayed nearly 15 to 20 years in the biggest Dalit Basti in Maharashtra called Indura. Mm -hmm. So whether it was Mayanagar and the Dalit Panther, Dalit Panther movement, I was completely, uh, I knew all the top leaders at Siddharth Vihar they were. And the main center of conflict of the Dalit Panther movement, the ground level work was in fact in Worli where I was working. Mm -hmm. And Mayanagar was, because I educated the people on, on the issue, they were the, in the lead of the, at the ground level mm -hmm. uh, fighting. Then it was Shiv Sainik, so Marathas out there, the DD Chols. But the refuge in the battle that took place for nearly six months in Worli, the main refuge for people was in Mayanagar. Mm -hmm. They would fight and then come here because it was so, so well located. I've illustrated that in my book also. Obviously, you joined left movement and you were projected as a dreaded Naxalite in the country. Yeah. When you were taken to the jail with this kind of label, with this kind of image, yeah. what was the reaction of jail authorities, security personnel and all other staff there? Actually, the, the entire media, it was a media trial basically. And uh, some 10 cases are still there. Of course, that's their method in Andhra. They just put cases and they don't file the charge sheet, So you get default bail. So those mm -hmm. are just lying around. And basically, the two, three left in which I got bail and uh, probably they'll wind up by the end of this year. So, but uh, the thing is that what I found in the entire journey, except for Delhi, where this, you know, this, I think it's very corrupt and crude and this thing that the jail staff and the police also, but everywhere else, whether it was the police or the jail staff or the uh, or bureaucracy, anything, they were very uh, cooperative and very sympathetic sort of, they were always, I don't know, I got some sort of image that I'm a great or no, great knowledge economist. Mm -hmm. So even top police officers would come and try and talk to me about the economy, the future of the economy, what is going on. That was there right in, even in Surat that was there, very nice people, the police and uh, in Jharkhand also it was like that. And in, of course, Andhra has a history of being sympathetic. So, of course, it was very positive. Basically, mm -hmm. except for Del Delhi, I had excellent judges and an lo excellent lawyer. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the authorities were a little bit crude. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the Delhi culture. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, everywhere else, I was in uh, uh, Telangana, that's Hyderabad, Vishaka, Patiala also. Patiala also was excellent. The police and everyone was excellent. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I had a very, uh, basically, a positive. People are fair, basically. And I think if they, they saw that... Uh, I didn't live like any Don or the, some of the other top th this thing, spending money. I didn't have that much mon money. They saw that basically I 
given up everything for the cause of the people mm -hmm. and uh, we are not just uh, organizers or that type of refer we are ideologues also I, I, we are ideologues they really I mean the police even I mean there was some great blood of propaganda must be somewhere because they all thought that it was a top economist mm -hmm. so they would want uh, information on the economy my perspective they would come and sit separately with me on that in the jail so, you spend a lot of time with so-called terrorists, you spent time with Afzal Guru, you spent yeah. time with a lot of mafia uh, leaders mm. or mafias yeah. from the north and from the south. Yeah. What was that experience like? Actually, Afzal Guru was not really a terrorist. I mean, uh, it was all a media, this thing, his thing. He was uh, a Sufi. He believed in Rumi, his main th He introduced me to Rumi's writings and he was against the killing in, of public. Yes, he was said that uh, Kashmir is a virtual open prison and we need our freedom that much he felt strongly about but otherwise he didn't uh, believe in this throwing bombs in the public and all that he was dead against that and also he wasn't a fundamental Islamic because I spoke to many fundamentalists who also were in the high risk ward of Tihar and in Hyderabad you can't, couldn't speak to them for more than uh, five minutes or ten minutes they just wanted to convert you to Islam that's all they they approach but he would discuss Noam Chomsky, he would discuss uh, other writers, leftist writers, he would know about the uh, left movement. He was an intellectual also, unlike most of the others mm -hmm. uh, who were just uh, uh, this thing. And as far as the Don goes, the Brijay Singh, I stayed a whole year and a half. He's the topmost Don, they say, in India. And there was others like Sunil Rathi who was involved. Basically, they had sort of respect because they also have some sort of uh, Robin Hood image. Though they are very feudal and ruthless also, mm -hmm. and they've amassed huge money. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the UP feudal culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, were victims of it and they were, as I've outlined in my book also, they were victims of it and they also then became sort of some sort of feudalist thing. Mm -hmm. But they had a Robin Hood image, so they sort of had, see, had a sneaking respect for what the, I was portrayed as a Naxalite and violence because violence for them was not an issue they were all violent so that was not a problem with them but mm. uh, they had that because they themselves had that approach and I found them not positive I mean certainly probably better than politicians I, that's my presentation and Jharkhand there was this other Don Titu Sharma who was even better I mean much more refined and things like that mm. and uh, Basically, there were light between in the, I found with Jarkin because he was very helpful to me. The Naxalites there, there were about 100, 150 of them. They didn't help at all, but he helped a lot. And uh, he was in touch, he would be in the forest, he would meet them also. He would also be positive towards them. And I found in Jarkin Bihar that belt, the line between business and contractors and mafia is very thin. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you can't really mm -hmm. tell the difference. So, along with these people, you also spend time with one of the accused in Nirbhaya rape case. We'll talk about it after a short break. Don't go anywhere. Keep watching Gomandak TV. Welcome to Gomandak TV once again. We are in chat with Kobad Gandhi who has been out of the jail in 2019 after spending 10 years in Tihar and rest of the jails in various parts of the country. And we are talking about his book Fractured Freedom as well as his journey right from the days of Dune School till today after the jail. Kobat, before mm -hmm. going to the break, we yeah. spoke about the time that you spent with all these mafia dons in the yeah, jail yeah. and different types of dreaded criminals. Yeah. You also spent time with this one of the accused in Nirbhaya rape case. Mm. How was that experience? <laughs> that, that was terrible. I mean, he was one of the most wild persons I've met mm. as a person and he had no repentance, whatever. I outlined a little bit of it. I was, uh, because some cell was being repaired, I, had to, I was pushed into his cell with three others and I was there for nearly two, a month or two. It was, he was, just he was a liar, he was a cheat, he was a this thing and he had no repentance for what he did. Mm -hmm. And when his, uh, I remember on the, what's it, December 12th, when is the nearby then? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, on those days, uh, mother would come out and I remember even him saying that uh, she should be raped, that oh. type of thing. Okay. So, okay. 
I mean, they were hanged finally. So there was no semblance of humanity left. Absolutely in him. none. There was none. At least in him, there was no humanity, even in relations or their relation on that issue. Mm-hmm. So that I, I don't know how the others were, but this chap was like that. The Vinay Sharma, he he was. The type of society that we live in today mm-hmm. creates this kind of element. That is the environment. It's the system which creates these criminals. Yeah. Now, when you started off. as a revolutionary yeah or as a person who wanted to change this system or bring about a change in this society yeah hmm. the situation was different the time was different now we are in a new era of hmm. globalization liberalization yeah. privatization how do you look at the social movements how do you retrospectively hmm. look at the ideology that you pursued at that time Well, Shailendra, let's put it like that, which I've started uh, in the uh, first part of my, uh, even the articles then, when I wrote it in 2012, was that uh, when I came to Marxism or that type of ideology, half the world was nearly communist. There were big movements all over. There was a lot of idealism, and there was a hope that uh, a new society could be born, which was more just than the existing system. and uh, i mentioned that also that's the actually the whole inspiration to write those articles and then this book came from that concept that just in my lifetime in just in the lifetime of one individual yeah it just in one individual right in these 40 50 years i've been an activist all these years and uh, the entire world was going towards communism socialism that thing and today nothing exists zero or practically zero if you take india also uh, whether it's the parliamentary left or the non parliamentary left they also in a very pathetic uh, state so whether it's worldwide socialism has collapsed in soviet union and uh, then china also the biggest billionaires in china no doubt they've raised the standard of living enormously in china of their entire populace mm. but it doesn't seem to have that type of i have to study it more but it doesn't seem to have that socialist content to it or at least communist then now whether because basically what does one aim that's what I, then i started retrospecting why why when actually the if you see at the time of lo- lockdown or uh, even now the gap between the richest and the poorest is increasing phenomenally probably never been so large and uh, what we find is that uh, in spite of this enormous oppression repression all that stuff that is going on where the alternative what is the alternative okay communism has failed but has cap- capitalist delivered so this question was troubling me when i started writing those articles and then this book some because and then i came to the conclusion well capitalism doesn't have the answer whether it's the keynesian model or the new liberal model these are just the two mill it's devastated not only the people it's devastated nature thoroughly devastated the environment and devastated the people so there is no answer there then what is the there's no third cause so basically i came to know socialism or a form of socialism can be the only alternative mm-hmm. and but then why have we failed then i uh, came because in the present new liberal model that exists the same idealism is not there there's no basis for it also because there's no socialist society around what can you get uh, cuba is there or some social democrats are there in latin america but those are not the type of things that we saw in our days with china or soviet union the new form of society so what what basically made me think is that we we can't put it uh, put the blame on external factors we have to look inwards and i came to the conclusion rightly or wrongly it's up to it's there in my third section basically the philosophical mm. aspect is there in my original articles also so it's the same basically that we have neglected the concepts of what i call value the new values what i put as the anuradha model because she was really that is basically simplicity naturalness no pretenses straightforwardness all these type of thing which she was came to her naturally actually mm. so that one is the values second is it has to go with freedom and happiness uh these have to be inculcated into our internal uh movement into our organization and things like that unless we ha- because if we don't have that goal of happiness we can be autocratic we can be dominating we can be manipulator because we are just wanting power and we are not bothered about that but if we have 
the goal is happiness, we would not want to hurt someone. So that is the first. People say, well, how are you talking about happiness in this? Uh, everything is sad because uh, 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 people are suffering so much and all that. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, we feel for the suffering, so we want an alternative. But I'm saying within us, if we have the goal of happiness, then we ourselves will be happy and we will see because what uh, if other people are happy that then we will be happy that thing if we are stiff and this thing and all that type of stuff then we will also be uh, uh, basically really not enjoying our work it'll be as a sort of duty mm -hmm. and uh, this thing and the question of freedom i start from the question of freedom there's freedom and fractured freedom is the name of the book it's fractured at every level political social cultural but I start from the individual, where we are alienated, what Marx called crippled monstrosities. We are alienated, our subconscious, which is actually Marx was not, Freud came after Marx. Uh, our subconscious mind is, uh, is programmed basically in the first eight to ten years of our life. Mm -hmm. All our emotions, values, thinking, all that stuff is there. Then we come to Marxism and we seek a change. But those things are there, programmed in our subconscious mind and they keep reflecting. And therefore, our conscious mind and the subconscious mind, the gap between that, leads to enormous amount of alienation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we become crippled, our creativity is crippled. Mm -hmm. And in India, particularly in India, I want to emphasize and I've tried to bring it, but I'll bring it more in this Brahminical outlook, just cripples a person totally. It makes, it, especially upper caste, of course, much more. But it, the entire society is inflected with this Brahminical outlook. And we have such a long non brahmic tradition, right from the Lokayas, Buddhist, Bhakti movement, right up to the present Phule Ambedkar Periya. I mean, but we don't, uh, Marxism has not taken that forward. We either copy Soviet Union or we copy China. That brings me to another point which you refer in your book. Yeah. You talk about Swadeshi, adopting Marxism to the Indian conditions and giving a message of Swadeshi through that. Sorry. Now, your message of Swadeshi seems to be a bit different from the typical message of Swadeshi that we get nowadays. In what way it is different and what kind of Swadeshi ideology or Swadeshi concept that you want to propagate? Actually, uh, my thinking now is basically that at the organizational level, we have to adopt these new methods of freedom, consciousness and uh, freedom, values, and other model and happiness and inculcate into our internal functioning so that we become better human beings and better so that things don't revert afterwards otherwise it becomes a waste you build a huge movement you build a state even but then you revert so what's the point so basic that but at the mass level i do believe that what we have always said a patriotic and democratic front is necessary patriotic in the sense that i feel that swadeshi means that Today, when our forefathers, that Dadabhai Nauroji and R.C. Dutt and all said the drain theory, uh, talked about the drain theory and the m money going abroad and therefore uh, resulting in backwardness here. Uh, I believe that this is still going on on a big scale. I mean, you see these tax havens, you see all our business houses. You, firstly, you see the TNCs, private equities and venture capitalists taking over everything in India. Yes. Whatever they haven't taken over, it's collaborated. Our money has all collaborations with uh, American uh, companies and I believe Adani has with China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also see the takeover like Flipkart's taken over by Walmart. So at that level it's operating. You also the digital moguls are operating here. We don't have our own servers. You press a button on Amazon and order something, some money will go to them in America, not here. So, basically, that is at one level. At the other level, everyone with money, black or white or whatever it is, a lot of black also, whether it's the business corporate houses, or the NRIs, the this uh, politicians, film stars, cricketers, anyone with the crores of money, thousands of crores of money, all of them have their money in tax havens and they normally have one family member based in Dubai, London or USA and uh, who do all the gachpach from abroad. So it's not as, and the most crude examples are the Nirav Modis and those who have looted our banks even. Mm -hmm. taken de They've taken loans from the banks, defaulted on the loans and sent the money abroad. So also our 
uh, real estate like JP and others have defaulted on the middle class people who have invested money out there, it goes both. So the point is that until this loot stops, unless the, what uh, the Adabai Nauroji and RC that called about the drain theory, unless our wealth remains in our country, India, I don't believe, will progress out of backwardness. That is the point of Swadeshi. Hmm. And the, many people talk of it, but they are opening on the country more and more to foreign capital and loot and sending the money abroad and tax havens. And nothing is touched. I mean, no one is touched. I mean, you see the, all hmm. these people in London, they are there, but uh, they've taken, they've looted the country, they're there and they're living great lives. That near, what's his name, that Choksi just now got citizenship of some Antigua or something like that. Mm. I mean, no one bothers about that because they're all hand in glove, mm. basically. Mm. And so that's the, I believe the, at one level, the Swadeshi level, that has to build a level that in true patriotism, that is. Not mm. the fake patriot, uh, uh, talking about Pakistan or Islam or something. Actually, the, d Protecting the wealth in the country and its people and its environment. Nature has been destroyed, our water has been destroyed, our land has been destroyed, our forest has been destroyed, everything has been destroyed here. Mm -hmm. This has to be rejuvenated also. I believe this also can be done with Swadesh. At the democratic level, I think in a country like India, democracy, not all this uh, election, this, that, or that's also okay, it takes place, is fine. But the essence of democracy in here is the non Brahmin movement. We have a three millennium hist history of uh, fighting the Brahmanism and through the Lokayats, as I said earlier, Buddhism and the Bhakti movement and right up to now, particularly Maharashtra has a rich tradition of that. And uh, so also in most of the country, there's a rich tradition. This is the people's culture. This is our democratic culture. Let us build on it, not the Brahmanical version of Hinduism. Your concept of Swadeshi is not a typical concept of Swadeshi that is being given to us on a platter by the so-called patriots. You talk about preserving the wealth of this country, arresting the flow of money which is going abroad from this country and you talk about enriching and enhancing the democratic traditions of this country. Kobar, it's been a pleasure talking to you. The time is short. We just had half an hour and within half an hour we had to talk about so many things. Yeah. I'm sure there are lots of things which can be spoken but here we have to stop. We have to take your leave. We thank you so much for being with us, for answering all our questions and giving us clarity about what kind of Swadeshi concept that you want to propagate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you on you. behalf of Gobantak yeah. TV. Thank but you. you don't go anywhere. Keep watching Gobantak TV. Thank you, Shailendra.